Okay, so our recording has now started and welcome again to everyone. And here we are gathering for our last of our five invitations. And now anybody else who comes will be able to join without going through the waiting room. So I won't have to stop and start. So welcome, glad that we're here. It's been three months that we've been doing this, uh, working together on the study group on the five invitations, discovering what death can teach us about living fully by Frank Ostaseski. The intent of this pop-up book club is to unpack how facing death can allow us to live more fully. My name's Raina Halpern, and I am a volunteer with the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation. Uh, the foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit inspired by the life of psychiatrist, humanitarian, and hospice pioneer, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. It was started one year after her death by her son, Ken Ross. And um, <clears throat> at this point in time, uh, we are in four continents, continuing her mission to develop hospice, palliative care, and grief support. And though Elizabeth is often described as the death and dying lady or the creator of the five stages, she's often referred to herself as the life and living lady. So we offer this class at no charge. If you're able, please consider a donation to support our work at ekrfoundation.org slash donate. I also just wanna let folks know that we also have a death cafe on the second Tuesday of the month that is open and free to everyone. And you can find out more about that on the website or at event Death, uh, Eventbrite, if you search Death Cafe EKR Foundation. I also host Death Cafes on the first, third, and fifth Tuesdays of the month at the same time, 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Pacific time. So my work is um, companioning people at the end of their lives, supporting their families and loved ones, and also working with people uh, who want to take the time and space at some point earlier in their lives to intentionally think about and plan for the end of their lives. I welcome you to reach out to me if you're interested in knowing more. Uh, the death work fills my heart and spirit with purpose, and it is my spiritual practice. And it was most inspired by um, my mom, who at the end of this month, on the 25th of this month, my mom will have died five, have died five years ago at the age of 94. Um, she had taught me so much, just not by, not only by being ready for death, but by how that readiness and our ability to finish, complete, saying our love, saying our goodbyes, how that readiness really gave me this liberated experience of grief when after her death. And I had had many deaths in my life. Um, a very dear friend who was raped and murdered, people I lost through car crash, AIDS, cancer and old age, but I never had this liberating experience before of loss being just powerful, powerful love. So I'm very grateful to my mom and also for her catapulting me into doing more of this work. She died five years and two hours after my sister died of metastasized cancer. So uh, this is, we'll just honor my mom today. That's what I would like to do as well as my sister. 
So I hope this is a safe space for you today, for all of us to share together and a welcoming open space. So as you know, our sessions are recorded. We have a meditation and contemplation. We have a video clip of Frank discussing the invitation and today, you're going to like it. Some people didn't like last month's because it was only seven minutes and this month's is 17. So you're going to like it. I think it's, it's really a good one. Um, and then we break up into small groups to really discuss and um, share the invitations meaning for us personally. Uh, we gather together for key takeaways and we have a short closing poem. And today I'd like to have a little time to hear your feedback at the end of the class on, um, on the whole experience, what worked for you, what you would like to improve, other ideas, other books you might like to do because Susan Barber and I are discussing what we would like to do next. So I'm really interested in hearing from you if you know your ideas and feedback. Okay, so with that, I'm going to go on with uh, a review of the fifth invitation. And I hope I'm just checking to make sure. Okay, everything's okay in the chat. So, um, okay, so our first invitation was don't wait, seize the moment, seize life fully. It was a very strong foundational invitation, a wake up call. Our second invitation built organically from the first, welcome everything, push away nothing. Our third invitation, bring your whole self to the experience, a call for complete acceptance. Our fourth invitation, find a place of rest in the middle of things. Each builds upon the other as warp and weft of a finely woven, warm quilt. Our fifth invitation is cultivate don't mind, don't know mind. Cultivate don't know mind. So what is don't know mind? Frank says, don't know mind is one characterized by curiosity, surprise, and wonder. It is receptive and ready to meet whatever shows up as it is. Suzuki Roshi said in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the expert's mind, there are few. Don't know mind is not limited by agendas, roles, and expectations. It is free to discover. Not knowing is very intimate. In Zen, the word intimate is synonymous with awakening, realization, or enlightenment. The heart has to be soft before any of us can be free. He says, surrender is more about expansion. It's not the same thing as letting go. It happens when we stop fighting, fighting against ourselves, fighting with life, fighting with death. Form is emptiness, and emptiness itself is form. Emptiness is openness, spaciousness, boundlessness. The contemplation of life, death, and the inherent mystery in each moment is too important to be left to our final hours. Coming to terms with our fears and discovering what dying has to teach us about life are essential to our transformation. These five invitations are a call to transformation. They could take you to the threshold but it's up to you to walk on. As Rumi wrote, the door is round and open. Don't go back to sleep. In the last chapter of the book, you might have seen the Japanese death poems. I hope you'll have a chance to write your own at some point. I'm just gonna read two of these poems. One is by Dogen Zenji who died in 1253. 
Four and fifty years I've hung the sky with stars. Now I leap through what shattery. And Kozan as Ichiko, who died in 1360. Empty handed, I entered the world, barefoot, I leave it. My coming, my going, two simple happenings that got entangled. So we have five invitations and today don't mind, don't know mine, just seems very fitting. So with that, we're going to go ahead and sit for five or six minutes in silent meditation. Uh, first, we'll sit silently for about three minutes, and then I'll read the questions. And we typically have had five questions that Frank has um put out in his study guide today we're going to have four just because the fifth one is about writing a Japanese death poem so um, we will go ahead and prepare prepare for meditation um, if you have a practice then you know feel free to do what you like to do and if you're new to meditation please feel free to just follow your breath in and out and gently come back if you notice yourself being distracted so i am going to set us up for three minutes of silent meditation and then i'll go right in to um, reading the questions for your contemplation.
in the questions for your contemplation. Don't know mind is one characterized by curiosity, surprise, and wonder to empty our minds and open our hearts. How did you respond to a recent surprise? Were you flexible or not flexible? How did you respond to a recent surprise? Were you flexible or not flexible? How do you feel when you forget the name of a place or a person? How do you feel when you forget the name of a place or a person? Think of a moment when you instinctively understood something or what to do without figuring it out. Think of a moment when you instinctively understood something or what to do without figuring it out. Surrender is a state in which resistance of any kind ceases to occur. Surrender is a state in which resistance of any kind ceases to occur. Think of a positive experience of surrender. We'll sit for one more minute in silence. Okay, welcome back. I hope that was a nice space for you. So next, we're going to go ahead and uh, watch Frank. And um, Jan is here to text me if there's any audio or video problem. Thank you, Jan. And we will go ahead and listen to this. And like I said before, it's a little, it's longer. It's about 16, 17 minutes. So I hope you enjoy. I'm going to turn off my camera and audio now just so that doesn't interfere with your screen. And here we go. The fifth uh, invitation is um, cultivate don't know mind. Cultivate don't know mind. Now, I felt obliged to put something Zen-like in this list, starting the Zen hospice and all. Um, cultivate don't know mind isn't, a, isn't the way of cultivating 
It's not about cultivating ignorance. You know, don't know mine is not ignorance. Ignorance is that I know something, but it's the wrong thing, and then I insist on it. That's ignorance. And there's a lot of that going on in the country right now. <laughs> don't know mine that represents something more... Well, it's off the charts from knowing and not knowing. It's a, a mind that's characterized by curiosity and wonder and awe, discovery. You know, when our minds are made up, it kind of narrows our vision, and we don't let much else in sometimes. So don't our mind is an invitation, really, to empty our minds and to open our hearts, you know. I, I told you I had a heart attack, and I was in the hospital. And um, after this big surgery, you know, you're intubated, which means the machine is breathing for you, and then you're br brought into a cardiac care unit, and... Uh, my son was there with me, and my best friend is a meditation teacher. And uh, I was intubated still, and I had tubes coming in and out of every orifice, you know, morphine going into one arm, clot busting drugs into another, like that. And it was this kind of sci fi kind of environment where monitors were beeping, and I was in this anesthesia haze. And into the room came this, uh, I think, a respiratory therapist who said, Let's pull out that tube and see if you can breathe. And I said, no, no. And I could feel something was wrong. Later, I, had, I found out that they had cut my phrenic nerve by mistake, and my left lung wasn't, my diaphragm wasn't working, so my left lung wasn't inflating. So anyway, um, I, I, my friend, uh, my dear friend was there, my meditation teacher friend, and I wrote on a pad, I'm scared. And he said, find your breath. And I started to find my breath, but I couldn't find my breath. I couldn't distinguish what was the machine breathing and what was me breathing. So I said, no. And he said, then sense your body. And I tried to sense my body, but I really couldn't because there was this anesthesia haze, you know, going through my whole body. And then I remembered one of my teachers, Suzuki Roshi. He was the founder of the San Francisco Zen Center. Extraordinary small Japanese man, fierce, with a big heart. And the night before he was dying, he wanted to take a bath. And his wife, Okasan, said, no, 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 you can't do that. But he insisted, and so his son, Otohiro, you know, he picked his father up, and he carried the great Suzuki Roshi to a bathtub, and then he lowered him into the bathtub. And as he lowered the great Suzuki Roshi into the bathtub, Suzuki Roshi became terrified. He was afraid he would drown. Suzuki Roshi couldn't swim. He was afraid he would drown. And uh, his son said to him, uh, Father, calm yourself. Find your breath. I'll breathe with you. Yeah. And Suzuki Roshi was able to stabilize and enjoy his bath. So in the hospital, when the, all this was going on, I remembered this. Somehow, I don't know, your teachers come to you when you most need them. And so I grabbed my friend, the meditation teacher, and I pulled him close to me. And I put my mouth, I put my ear rather close to his mouth. And he understood. And I borrowed the rhythm of his breathing until I could stabilize and find my own again. Yeah. When we're busy knowing, we, we forget these things. So don't know mine opens possibilities for us. You know, the night before that surgery, my son came to see me, and I, and I love my son beyond words, you know. And uh, we're in the middle of this, well, actually, he got a video for us to watch that night. It was called The Bucket List. <laughs> I didn't know it, but after watching the first few moments, I said, no, let's shut that off. Let's <laughs> So we're having a conversation, and in the middle of this ordinary conversation, he said, Dad, are you going to live through this? And I love my son. Of course, I wanted to reassure him, so I started to say, yes, of course, it'll all be fine. But out of my mouth, I heard myself say, I'm not taking sides. <laughs> and it shocked us both. It really surprised us. I wasn't trying to be Buddhist or sage or any of these things. It was just what was true. I wasn't taking sides between life and death in that moment. 
And it really shocked us. We both were sort of dumbfounded for a few moments. And then we relaxed, you know, because when truth's in the room, we relax. Yeah. <laughs> Cultivate don't know mind. You know, there's um, a lot of talk in spiritual communities about awakening and enlightenment and nirvana and all these kinds of ideas. Um, But they all feel a little far off to me. So when people ask me what my practice is, I say intimacy. Learning to be intimate with myself and the world around me. Uh, To me, intimacy better expresses the, the feeling, you know, what it's like to be alive. There's another expression uh, in Zen that says, uh, the path is right beneath your feet. In other words, don't go looking at far off places. The intimacy of don't know mind, it, encourages, it gives us the encouragement, really, connects us with the sound of the birds, you know, and uh, this very life, and the truth that's here now for a moment, and then it's gone. It connects us with the sacredness of things. You know, to know the sacred, it's not about seeing new things. It's about seeing things in a new way. The sacred's not something separate or different from the rest of life. It, it's hidden in everyday life. I, I was... Um, we had a hospice unit at a place called Laguna Honda Hospital in San Francisco. It's an old-style hospital. It's since been upgraded, but it was built before the turn of the last century, in the 1890s. And it's open wards of 30 or 40 people to a room. Yeah? Bed after bed after bed. There's nothing like it this side of Calcutta. And, uh, and I thought, when we were first invited to start a hospice there, I thought, no, we should close this place down. And then I thought, no, you know, if we can show that it's possible here, we can demonstrate it, we can demonstrate it here and that it's possible anywhere. So anyway, one day I was walking down this gauntlet of beds and there was an older African-American man. Um, I saw him out of the corner of my eye and he was sweating up a storm and breathing with great difficulty. So I went over to sit next to him and he was actively dying, you know. There he was, right in the middle of it. And uh, I sat down beside him and I said, uh, you look like you're working really hard. And he said, yeah, just got to get there. And he pointed like that. And I said, oh. I said, if, if I promise to keep up, can I come? And he said, yeah, and he grabbed my hand. And I said to him, I, I can't see there into the distance. Can you see? I didn't bring my glasses. And he said, yeah, and he described a sloping hillside to a kind of plateau. And I said, you want to go? Yeah. Okay, let's go. So he grabbed my, he took my hand and we started walking up this hill. And it was a lot of work. He was sweating up a storm. He was breathing with great difficulty. It was a heavy hill to walk up, you know. And then when we got to the plateau, I said, can you see there further into the distance? And he said, yeah. I said, describe it for me. I can't make it out. And he described a little one-room red schoolhouse with three steps and a door. This is a man who was born in Mississippi. Now, I could have said to him at this point, you're disoriented times three. <laughs> this is the result of the brain metastasis and the morphine that's on board. Let me rearrange you to time and space. But none of that was true. What was true is we were walking to a little red schoolhouse. And I said, there's the door. You want to go in? Yeah. I said, can I go? I always ask permission. He said, no. I said, okay, then then you go. In a little while, he died quite peacefully. Sacred's not about seeing something new or different. Sacred's hidden in the ordinary of things. It's it's a new way of seeing. So... Don't wait. Dying folks taught me that. Don't wait. Welcome everything. Push away nothing. 
Find a place of rest in the middle of things. Cultivate, um, don't know mine. Yeah? These are the five invitations I have for you tonight. I hope they're of some value to you. Now, before we end, I, I want to, I don't know, we've been watching, you've been watching the photos? Yeah, amazing, huh? Did you see her? She was in that rotation. This is a woman who came into our hospice. We lived kind of on the margins of society. Tough gal. And this was taken two hours after she came into the hospice. Yeah? Pretty fierce. This is her, same woman, two hours after she died. Yeah? So what happens in between? I think what happens in between is you give people a chance to reflect, to contemplate their life, to find out what has, you know, what the purpose of this life has been. To really look back over their life. You know? To make amends if that's necessary, to offer love if that's what's necessary. To give them a chance to talk about it. You know, to express what's important. I think that's important. To give them a chance to maybe to write about it. She used to journal every day, you know. This was the kitchen in our hospice. Yeah. And I think you provide compassionate companionship. You know, and that doesn't mean uh, expertise necessarily. You know, it just means being real with people. It's intimate work, you know. You can't do this work from a distance. How do you get from that to that? You see on her bed clothes, there's a piece of paper there. I'll tell you a story about it. She... Um, I was sitting in the kitchen where you saw her journaling one day reading a book of Japanese death poems. And in this tradition in Japan, a monk or a layperson, on the day of their death, writes a poem that expresses some essential truth about their life. Yeah? How awake do you have to be for that? And if you, if you don't die that day, it doesn't count. Yeah? <laughs> you have to write a new one the next day. Yeah. So I was reading this book of Japanese death poems, and she said, what is that? And I explained the tradition. She said, I want to write one of those. And I said, good idea. Good idea. You should do it. She said, well, what's the form? I said, oh, don't worry about the form. Just, just write it. So she went upstairs to her room, and several hours later, she summoned me to her room. And, uh, and I sat down there. She said, don't sit down. She said, stand up. I said, okay. She said, I've written my death poem. And when I die, I want you to pin it to my bedclothes and I want to be cremated with it. And I said, Still, I, I, so no, I promise I will do that. And then she said, uh, and I want you to learn it. I want you to learn it by heart. She didn't say memorize it. People's words are really important. She said, learn it by heart. So she taught it to me right there. She said, I want to know that it lives in someone's soul. Yeah. You want to hear a poem? Yeah. I, you know, for 25 years, I never wrote this poem down. And then finally, when we were doing the book, I, I decided that I really wanted it to be in the book. People have been asking me for it for years, and I've been crazy about it. I haven't let people have it. I just felt like it was an oral thing that she gave to me. But I, I talked to her granddaughter about it, and her granddaughter said, yeah, I think that'd be great. So we decided to put it in. It's the very last thing in the book. So her poem goes like this. Um, Don't just stand there with your hair turning gray. Soon enough the seas will sink your little island. So while there is still the illusion of time, set out for some other shore. No sense packing a bag. You won't be able to lift it into your boat. So give away all of your collections. Take only new seeds and an old stick. Send out some prayers on the wind before you sail. Don't be afraid. Someone knows you're coming. An extra fish has been salted. This is a woman you might have walked by on the streets. Don't just stand there with your hair turning gray. There's a lot of that going on in this room. Soon enough the seas will sink your little island. So while there is still the illusion of time, set out for some other shore. No sense packing a bag. You won't be able to lift it into your boat. So give away all of your collections. Take only new seeds and an old stick. That's a great line. 
You think about farmers, you know, putting a stick in the ground and dropping a seed in. This is a woman who understands death is not a full stop, at least not in her mind. Send out some prayers on the wind before you sail. Don't be afraid. Someone knows you're coming. An extra fish has been salted. Thank you, Sona. Thank you, everybody. I hope you like that. It's mm. pretty beautiful. Yeah. It's almost like what, it's almost the chapter that you read. Almost exactly from it. So with that, we're going to move into our breakout groups. We'll really be able to talk about this invitation, but really talk also about the aggregate of invitations and what, what you take away from all five of them, the gestalt of all five of them, the accumulation, or you can focus on this one. So with that, let me just go ahead and focus on I'm going to stop the recording and then I'm going to put the questions into the chat. So just give me one moment. Starting the recording again. And I'd love to hear some takeaways, especially your own takeaway from either this invitation or from the whole experience of the five invitations. Would love to hear your takeaways. Who would like to share? You can raise your Zoom hand. Yeah, Lee. I just, I just really appreciate meeting everybody, and I think the book was wonderful, and the uh, ability or the availability of uh, meeting people from basically all over the world and listening to some some stories, and kind of makes it feel like uh, you're not alone out there. Yeah. Yeah, that connectivity. Who else? Who else would like to share a takeaway? Is that Carol, was your hand up? No, okay. I can put my hand up. <laughs> Go ahead, please. I have enjoyed every minute of this book club. I've been here for all five invitations and I really feel like it's the guiding light of how I'm conducting myself, you know, I'm thinking, am, am I accepting all the invitations? I, I'm welcoming everything, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not waiting, I'm planning, I'm doing things, I'm trying to be fully present, and I'm aware that when I'm not present, like it, it's bringing a greater awareness to all five invitations. They're just kind of just playing in a loop in my head, which is a good thing. So, but this last invitation was the most difficult for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can I ask why it was difficult? Um, I had a hard, because I'm such a control freak, I had a hard time with the surrender and the letting go. And I don't like surprises and I like a lot of order and, I'm not really sure, but there's something there that is difficult for me. And I'll have to sit with that, cultivate the don't know mind. You know, I, I just wanna say about that is, um, it's, it's no mistake that why it's the last invitation. And, you know, it's, 
it's kind of the zen of all the other four and i i just hope you can just be kind and gentle with yourself because there's nothing about should or have to about this it's it's just about letting us all letting ourselves always be a beginner letting ourselves just always be open and come to everything afresh and anew and um, you know this idea that i read at the very beginning of, of that when you're a beginner, you have all these possibilities. When you're an expert, you only have, you have very few. And so there's nothing that you have to do or it's just about just embracing, embracing beginner mind with it. So I hope you'll, I hope you'll just kind of sit with that and just let it kind of wash over you. Cause I think that's, the great thing about these invitations is they they do they just kind of permeate our cells and just stay with us the more we contemplate them they're a practice thank you Kara. jane had your hand up and then david yeah well i think we were just talking about what i would perceive as safety I just hope everyone finds some way to feel safe in most of the conditions that they face. And I wouldn't know how to do that if I was in Ukraine right now, but I hope that for the children, at least someone can give them some sense of safety in spite of unbelievable conditions. So I guess maybe safety is such a great factor in, in our lives these days. Many people don't feel very safe. And um, I kind of forgot what I was going to say about, could you rephrase the question again so that I could answer that part of it? Uh, about the takeaway from either this invitation or all five invitations? Well, I just think don't know mine. I, the older I get, I used to be a know-it-all, but the older I get, the more I think I don't know much of anything. And it's great to Start it be starting all over again and learning art and music and other things that they provided for, through Rogel University of Michigan Cancer Center. And it's just fun to be a kid again and fun to discover all the things that uh, I had sort of let go in the interim. Well, thank you. And I wanted to compliment you on your co regulating voice. I've been working with Thomas Hubel and another person named Nikki Mirgafori on end of life stuff and um, uh, other things. And I think the voice for some of us that are auditory and your pacing and your tone of voice is very co-regulating. So thank you. I don't know whether that's a natural or something that you've worked at, but I'm trying to get so that I can respect the pause and pacing when I talk, because I tend to be a kind of a fast talker. And that sort of excites people's nervous systems. So it can, it can. Um, so thank you. I, I can see that you must have done a lot of inner work. So much appreciated. Thank you, Jane. That's very kind of you. David, David Smith. Hi. Well, my lights came on when somebody started talking about control. And one of the things that helped me at one time was someone said, you don't have to give up control. All you have to give up is your illusion of control. And somehow that helped. And yet I'm still trying to get on top of it. So I guess I haven't learned it altogether yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. Who else would like to share a takeaway? Yeah. Hi there. I'm sorry I was late joining, but um, I it resonated with me that the last invitation was more difficult. And I think one of the ways I'll get my head around things better is I plan to read the book a second time, because I think especially after our discussions and our sharings and having further time to reflect on it, I think I'll find a lot of additional meaning when I go through the second time again. 
So that's one thing that um, I'm looking forward to. And I don't know if anybody mentioned uh, anything about the epilogue, but where he did the uh, death poems, I really enjoyed those. And I especially, I, I think I especially enjoyed because um, I know that sometimes I tend to be too serious. And I think part of it is just because I'm trying to get it. And part of it is because I feel very passionate about this work. So I, I get very focused. So I love the one from um, Mariah Sinan. I have no idea if that's how you really say the name. Um, but it's very brief, so I'll read it. Um, Bury me when I die beneath a wine barrel in a tavern. With luck, the cask will leak. And I liked it because it just helped me lighten up a little bit about all of this. And I, th I think, you know, it's a serious topic that we don't have to take it. I don't, I should say, I don't have to take it so seriously. So I appreciated that. Thank you, Deb. Teresa. Can you unmute, please? <clears throat> that, that last statement was just kind of a segue into something I had been thinking. Um, it was fun meeting with the, uh, our group a while ago, our breakout group. But one of the things I've noticed looking at the gallery of pictures and in our our group, um, this was a very serious invitation, but I think maybe it, it's like, I can't say it's like a party, but because we followed each other and uh, so intensely, I've been in all of them, was afraid I would miss this evening. Um, it, 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 there was a bonding and a sharing. And uh, although this is serious, it, it almost, Every it, it seems like many of the spirits are much lighter than what we were going into it. And so that that Deb just said kind of segue into the things when Lee brought it up about enjoying getting to meet the people and looking at people, <clears throat> the, the spirits, the faces. Uh, there seems to be a lot of joy radiating, although this was an extremely intense chapter. So I think it was the bonding, the connection, the sharing that has brought maybe some, some light in the faces of those and the voices of those, the spirits of those that we've connected with. So I appreciate uh, the group. I appreciate my friend Jan Brewer for connecting me to so very much and uh, otherwise I would not have known about the group so I choose to thank everyone because because I've had the honor of of um, connecting with so many here so thank you thank you Teresa I'd like to just spend a few minutes on any suggestions you have for improving this study group or pop-up book club or ideas for a new uh, book. I'm particularly interested in um, near-death experiences. Um, there's a lot of good books out now and if people would be interested, I'm just wondering in a pop-up book club that you used um, one of the really good books that's out these days, or maybe you have other ideas. I know we talked briefly about um, Stephen Levine's book, A Year to Live, which is often used as a, a study, a book for a study group as well. So any ideas about topics you'd like to do about um, what worked for you in this three month experience, what ideas you have for improving it. So those are the, the that's what's on the table now. And I saw Lee's hand was up. Yeah, I don't care what book it is. I just want to keep it going. This is great. 
Lee, you're great. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Feel free to unmute, keep yourselves unmuted while we're talking. You can just jump in if you have a suggestion. Things that work, things that didn't work, interest in another study group. Uh, one Any thing I thought worked very well was um, Everybody was very, um, very engaged, but it felt to me like everybody had a great opportunity to share from their experience. Uh, it, it seemed like um, everybody shared and sometimes in some groups, there are those that just, which is fine, we say that's fine, but there are those that just sit aside and don't really connect and engage and share from their experience. So I thought that was particularly good in this group. Great, thanks. Yes, share this. Um, this is a little off the subject. Um, I was wondering if some way you could give us the names of those books that you think are excellent about near-death experience. Ah, I, I, you know, I don't have them in my head at this moment. I'm sorry. I, I've, got, I've got one I can offer you. Um, it's called Hello from Heaven. It's a classic in the field. Yeah, um, there's a couple new ones that have been out. Um, I read Hello from Heaven. Um, but there's a couple newer ones that have come out in the last year that I'm just not remember. I think one is actually called Near Death Experience or something very similar that I've heard is very, very good. Maybe you could send them to the group uh, at some time when they come to your thoughts. Okay. Santal, Santal would you, do you have a comment? Um, uh, uh, well, one of them was, um, was it, it sounds like the group might be interested in uh, near death experience because several people have, um, have said, you know, have piped up about it. Um, I, you know, I'd, I'd also be happy to read A Year to Live because I know Susan always bangs on about Stephen Levine and how much she loves him and all that kind of stuff. And I haven't read that book. So um, I think either, uh, you know, that or any other sort of near-death experience um, would, would grab my interest. But I'm kind of like Lee wanting to sort of continue because I have really enjoyed, um, you know, us gathering together and creating that sort of special segregated time to be respectful with each other and our feelings and be very sensitive around that. And that's not something that you get in our rush world. Um, so yeah, and the only other thing I would say that might improve my experience is being able to use the chat function. Um, at the moment, it's only set to you, but I would like to be able to, yeah. um, you know, get in touch with others yeah. in the group or be able to say something, so. And I, I did try, but that that's <laughs> how the foundation has it set. Yeah. And yeah. so I did not have control over that. Yeah. So I do appreciate it. Deb, please hold your thought. I just, mm -hmm. I want to hear from people who haven't had a chance sure. to speak as we get closer to 3.30. Um, folks, so do folks want, want to do another book? Would you yes. be interested? Mm -hmm. Yes. And is near death a good topic? So Stephen Levine or maybe near death? Okay. And also I just want people to know that we do have these death cafes and um, you know, it's three or four Tuesdays of the month, 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Pacific time. And they're just wonderful places, very, very safe, supportive, loving space for anyone to join, um, to talk about anything related to death and dying, loss, grief, et cetera. Um, Jan and David um, come to those. I think Deb has been to those uh, uh, once or twice. Teresa has a couple of times. And if you're in the meantime, uh, until we do this again, if you're looking for a safe space, I really hope you'll join us. We're really easy to find on Eventbrite. 
either Mission Hospice Death Cafe or EKR Foundation Death Cafe. So I hope you'll join us for that. And, I have a book uh, suggestion, if, if you yeah. could take it real quick. Sure. Uh, I, uh, on the practical end of things, I think a book that's quite helpful and quite sweet is uh, The Gentle Art of Swedish Death Cleaning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Yeah, I, I do know that book, too. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, one last quick thing is for anyone that is interested in um, near death experience, there's a man named um, William Peters who talks specifically about shared death experience. And this is about people who are living, um, who share the experience of someone who is passing over to the, to the next life and he's had his own shared death experience. But anyway, his name, William Peters, he's just about to launch um, a course uh, that people can take about shared death experiences. Um, and I, I think that his website is called um, shared crossing shared crossings project.com shared crossings project.com yeah that's it or just google his name William Peters thank you thank you Santa so um, I'm going to wrap us up uh, I'm going to take us one to two minutes over and leave you with a poem what do you think Yep. For a poem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How could we not have a poem to end yeah. our to end our special time together? So here it is. And this is again Mary Oliver, the goddess. And this poem is called Bone. Bone by Mary Oliver. Understand, I am always trying to figure out what the soul is and where hidden and what shape. And so last week when I found on the beach the ear bone of a pilot whale that may have died hundreds of years ago, I thought maybe I was close to discovering something for the ear bone is the portion that lasts longest in any of us, man or whale, shaped like a squat spoon with a pink scoop where once in the lively swimmer's head, it joined its two sisters in the house of hearing. It was only two inches long and thought the soul might be like this, so hard, so necessary, yet almost nothing. Beside me, the gray sea was opening and shutting its wave doors, unfolding over and over its time ridiculing world. I looked, but I couldn't see anything through its dark knit glare, glare. Yet don't we all know the golden sand is there at the bottom, though our eyes have never seen it, nor can our hands ever reach it, lest we would sift it down into fractions and facts, certainties, and what the soul is. Also, I believe I never will quite know. Though I play at the edges of knowing, truly I know our part is not knowing, but looking and touching and loving, which is the way I walked on softly through the pale pink morning light. And that poem wonderfully expresses don't know mind, I think. So I want to thank you really each of you for being here. And for those that are here via recording, I want to thank Susan Barber, the wonderful Elizabeth Kubler Ross, the magnificent, her son Ken Ross, who's incredibly dedicated. Frank Ostaseski, the Meta Institute, and uh, Hospice, Santa Barbara Hospice. And thank you for being here. And I hope you'll join us at our Death Cafe. And 
we will let you know. Um, you know, the idea is to do this once a year uh, for a few months. So I know people want to keep it going. I will see if there's any way we can do that, but. I will be in touch via Susan, an email from Susan about next steps. So with that, I wish you all much love, many blessings, deep gratitude. Thank you so much.